My name is Dan Young and welcome to the Millionaire Code Podcast. I'm a self-made guy that has made multi-million dollar businesses from scratch. There's no way I could have done it without the help of mentors who provided me with the wisdom and guidance to help me create the formula for success. Each week on my podcast, I'm going to interview a hugely successful business person that will provide you their secrets to success. And that way, you can act as your mentor too. I can't wait to share their stories and takeaways with you. Welcome to Dan's Millionaire Code. Hey, everybody. Dan Young here with Dan's Millionaire Code. And every week, I bring you a world-changing entrepreneur who's making a massive difference uh, in this world. There's only two things I ask you to do with this uh, podcast video is one, execute what you've learned here, take good notes and execute, and two, share it with your loved ones and friends who could benefit um, because there's some really great information. And as you know, every week I, I bring you an amazing guest. And this week's guest is super amazing. So let me just tell you about him a little bit. It's Dr. Eric Cole. And um, he's a computer and cybersecurity expert with uh, over 30 years of security experience. Um, he's worked, for, uh, worked with Fortune 500 companies, top international banks, and also with the CIA. Um, he's been featured on CNN, uh, CBS, Fox News, and 60 Minutes. Um, he was also the CTO and SVP of McAfee, which you've probably heard of, um, and a chief scientist at Lockheed Martin. Dr. Cole consults uh, in information technology with a focus on cybersecurity and uh, kind of our, my space a little bit too as well. So we have a lot of stuff uh, in common. He's also served as a member of the Commission on Cybersecurity for the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Uh, welcome, Eric. Pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. So, um, boy, man, I'm really, really excited about having you on board because right now with everybody telecommuting and working from home and companies, they're sending everyone home to work remotely, there's a lot of uh, big security issues. And um, what I wanted to ask you, first of all, is just give me a brief summary of your experience with cybersecurity, because you're one of the foremost experts in the field. Uh, sure. So one of the themes you'll notice of my life and career is that I'm very big on taking advantage of opportunities and really listen to that inner voice. It, it sort of guides you on the way you should go. So, so real quick, I was majoring in computer science. This was back in the late 80s. And I was sitting in class and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to major in computer science or not because it was more engineering and Fortran classes. And something kept telling me, go to the intern office, go to the intern office. And I remember it was a Thursday afternoon and I don't know why, but it was like, you have to go today. So I go down, I was on the other side of campus. I go down to the intern office and she goes, Eric, it's so funny you came in because once every two years, the CIA recruits on campus and they're coming tomorrow and we have one slot left. So uh -huh. if I waited a day, if I waited a week, I would have missed the opportunity. So I go in and I interview with the CIA and we go through the whole process and I pass and they bring me down for doing an intern. And at that point, I have to go and see which office I want to work for. So there was networking, there was policy, there was programming, and there was this little office called cybersecurity. And this is one of the other themes of my life is don't listen to what other people tell you because sometimes they want to protect you and keep you safe and you need to jump and follow your dreams. So everyone, including my advisor, was like, no, 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 you got to networking operation is the way to go with programming. Cybersecurity is a fad. It's going to go away in a couple of years. No one's going to care about it. And I was like, no, no, this is cool stuff. So I went in and picked the cybersecurity. So I go down that route, and then one final thing that you see it all ties together is I'm sitting in a meeting with all the execs, and we're moving things to the internet. And a voice inside me once again said, raise your hand. And you're not supposed to do that, right? In these meetings, you're supposed, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a low GS employee. You're supposed to sit there and be quiet. So I raise my hand, and I ask a simple question that changed my life. How do we know these systems are secure? If we're putting them out on the internet, how do we know they're secure? How do we know they're safe and protected? And they look at each other and they go, Eric, thank you for volunteering to solve that problem. And they go, I wasn't volunteering. I was just asking the question. But that's what happens in those cases. So what I realized is there's no way to prove a system is secure. You can only prove it's not secure by trying to break in. So I essentially began my journey of eight years of being a professional hacker for the CIA where I learned how to think like the offense, act like the offense, and break into any system that's out there. 
And then after doing that for eight years, I'll be honest with you, I got bored. Because it's too easy breaking in. So, so that's when I left the agency and I began my parallel career of entrepreneurship and cybersecurity, where I'm really on a mission to make cyberspace safe. And now I focus on defense. Because one thing I recognize is there's three fundamental things that most people don't realize. Mm -hmm. One is they're a target. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone thinks they're only going to go after the big folks, the government or the Fortune 50, and anybody who does anything as a target. Second is cybersecurity is your responsibility. And third is all technology that has functionality. The only way you can have functionality is if you have security risks. So all the technology that you utilize have exposures and risk, and people just need to be more aware of it so they can protect themselves, their family, and their businesses online. Wow, that's that's incredible. CIA and again, consulting with the president uh, before. This is incredible. Uh, what are some of the largest dangers for companies? And maybe I can give you a second piece of that question is for just normal people, you know, working from home and, and that people that are self-employed. Uh, right now, the number one issue is emails, is be careful of any emails that you receive that have an attachment or an embedded link. Cyber adversaries and attackers, they love when people are emotional. Because when you're emotional, you make quick, fast decisions and you don't always think through the process. Do you realize over 70% of the emails that people receive that say COVID-19 in the subject line actually contain malicious content? Wow, because that's pretty high. The cyber adversaries know that if you're receiving something, you're so concerned. The most famous one that we see a ton of, it has a subject line. Three of your employees tested positive for COVID-19. And then it says, find out the details because you might have been exposed and didn't realize it. Click this link. And everyone clicks the link. And one click is all it takes. And your system gets compromised. So you got to be really careful of the emails. Now, here is where I differ from most security professionals, because most security professionals are going to tell you, don't click on links, don't open attachments, delete, delete. Now, here's the reality of it. If it comes down to the safety of you and your family, you're going to click on the link. I can tell you all day long, don't click on a COVID-19 link, but if you believe it's going to protect you and your family, you're going to do it every day of the week. So that's, to me, bad advice because people don't follow it. Here's what we do. We go a level deeper. We've examined over 500 samples of malware and 100% of it runs on Windows computers. So here's the advice I give. When you're checking email or surfing the web or clicking on ads for toilet paper or hand sanitizer, use a non-Windows based computer. Use your iPhone, use an iPad, use an Android because all of the malware will only infect Windows. It doesn't infect the other OSs. So if you use a non-Windows-based computer, now you can still keep your family safe. You can still click on the links, but now you're staying one step ahead of the adversary. Yeah, one thing that we've discovered, because we, you know, our companies, we fix PCs and also we service some Macs as well. And we found that some of the Macs now, as of recently, have gotten some sort of infections um, inside of there. And, and typically they're not uh, malware-based. Sometimes... They can be what we found. But the one thing that we've seen a lot of is phishing scams, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, like, put in your, 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 your Outlook, or Outlook or iCloud credentials, right? Put it in here. Hey, we've got some files for you. Those kind of things. Whether it's your email or on those kind of things. Are you seeing a, a rise in those sort of attacks as well? Uh, absolutely. Anything to steal credentials and information. On the business side, the one we're seeing a huge uptick in the last month are financially different driven fraud because nobody's in the office. So we're seeing a lot of cases where emails are spoofed from a CEO or a vice president and sent to somebody in finance or somebody who approves it saying, hey, we need this invoice paid immediately. This is the account details. And while normally they might walk to their office or verify in person because they're working at home, they're like, okay, this happens all the time. It looks legit and they then fall for it, and then these companies are losing significant amount of money. We're actually working on four cases just this week that range anywhere from companies with these basic scams losing anywhere from 200000 
up to $12 million just because somebody scammed them. And here's what you got to be careful of. Just because you have security and two-factor authentication, always do out-of-band verification. So one of the famous ones is you'll get a call if you're in finance or even for a personal business, and they'll say, hey, this is the bank. I'm with Capital One Bank, and we've noticed some unusual activity with your account. We would like to verify with you this activity. You're going to be like, okay, thanks so much for calling me. And they're going to go, we're going to send you a one-time passcode right now to verify your identity. I need to make sure that I'm really talking with Eric. So can you check your text messages and tell me what that one-time code is? And everyone's like, oh, sure, okay. And what they've actually done is they're logging into your account and they activated the two-factor authentication, oh, and you're geez. actually giving them the one-time password, but they positioned it in such a way that many people don't have any clue that that's what's happening. So very important for individuals, business owners, executives, banks are never going to ask you for one-time passcodes. They're never gonna text you codes. You just have to recognize that that's not normal activity, and if you get any calls like that, you need to hang up as soon as possible and verify directly with your bank. Wow, that's that's a massive uh, scam that's happening right now. We've seen that actually, we've had companies call us as well saying, hey, someone tried to get us to wire the money or whatever it may be. <laughs> so even with two-stage, and those of you guys out there and girls that don't know what two-stage is, Eric, you wanna explain what two-stage authentication is? Uh, sure, so, so normal authentication is what you call one factor, it's a password. So you go to a site, you enter in your user ID, you enter in your password, you authenticate. The problem with that, it's static, and a lot of people don't change it very often, so it's easy for somebody to guess. So what we've done is we do something called 2FA or two-factor authentication, and the idea is now, and you might have seen this with your bank or credit cards, you log in, you enter in an initial password, and then you get text a one-time password. You then enter that in and it authenticates you and it's only good for that one time. So every time you have to access, you have to get text a new password. And this is another important piece. A lot of people go, oh, but that's an inconvenience. That's an inconvenience for me to have to re-enter it. And here's what I tell you. You can have a five second inconvenience every time you log in to have to enter in a second password or you can ignore it. And in 10 months, you can have a three-week inconvenience because you lost $200,000. Which inconvenience would you like? But we need to accept the fact you're going to have an inconvenience. It's not a perfect world. You have to pick which one is better, proactive or reactive. That's, that's a really great thing. You know, um, so there's the text message, two-stage, right? A two-factor authentication. Um, but there's also apps like Authy or Google Authenticator and Microsoft Authenticator. What's your opinion on, on those versus text messaging? Because from some, some, some articles I've read that people can actually hack steal your phone uh, ID as well. Um, do you have a little insight on that and what, what, what you think is the strongest level? Sure. So, so using those third-party apps that are integrated into your device are, in my opinion, much better because it's automatically integrated. You don't have to do anything. You're not doing it. You're just verifying to the third party Google Authenticator or RSA or whatever that app is that's running on your device. However, there's a little more cost than setting it up. So setting it up is good for internal use, but third parties, it's not always available. And yes, in a perfect world, that's a little safer. But here's the thing I always tell people. Cybersecurity is never about 100% secure. It, it doesn't exist if you have functionality. So it's about acceptable risk. So yes, mm -hmm. if somebody got my phone, authenticated as me, and, and got access to it, yes, they would be able to bypass two-factor authentication. Yeah. But what I always joke with folks is going, okay, if somebody physically took my phone from me, they forced me to give up my facial recognition, and they forced me to give up my passcode to get into the app, I have bigger problems at that point, right? Because somebody <laughs> yeah. probably has a gun to my head That's or right. they've kidnapped my children because those are the only two scenarios in which you can get me to give up that information. I'm not going to give up my data unless it's life-threatening to me or my family. So to me, yes, in those situations, it could happen, but it's not really practical. And that's one thing I always tell people is you got to be careful because there's some really 
smart security people, I love these guys, they're good friends of mine, that their focus is on how to break things. And they're gonna find weaknesses in everything. But to me, having a weakness that requires me to give up my biometrics, my passcode and others, in my opinion, that's an acceptable level of risk that I'm willing to assume. So um, I'm gonna shift a little bit to business owners because we have a lot of entrepreneurs who watch this podcast. Um, are there some, some areas of advice that you have for business owners as far as like wire transfer per, uh, protection and those kind of things? I have a couple ideas too, but I want to get your take on that. Uh, yeah, so a couple of things. First, what you have to remember with uh, business owners, bank accounts, wire transfers, is there's a magic number that you have to remember. And that number is 24. And that's 24 hours when you initiate a wire transfer with your bank there's a 24 hour hold in which it can be reversed. Oh. And I don't know if you've ever seen this where I've had this sometimes where companies have wired me money and then they either thought it was a mistake or there was a issue with invoicing and 12 or 14 hours later they withdraw it. So if you catch it within 24 hours, you're usually pretty good. Yeah. If you don't catch it until two or three weeks later, you're usually gonna be out the money. So first thing I recommend with all of your business and personal bank accounts is set up text notification whenever there's activity of wire transfer, EFTs or anything like that. Because now if you're sitting there and you get a text message that says somebody is trying to wire $200,000 to this account, if it's legitimate and you authorized it, you just go ahead and hit yep, one, you hit yes, and say it's okay. But if it wasn't you and it was fraud, you immediately can either call the bank or hit two that says no, and it will stop it immediately. So it's first and foremost is you gotta get that visibility into your account activity because most people wouldn't know about a fraudulent wire transfer until the end of the month when they check their bank account. And at that point, if you had any liability associated with it, you're actually going to be out the money. So that, that's sort of first piece of advice. Second piece of advice is go in, and I do this with all my business transactions and electronic fund transfers, EFTs, is I always require out-of-band verification. So the bank has to call me or I have to go down to the bank, which I know nowadays with COVID-19 is hard, but, but have an out-of-band verification. Don't ever allow somebody via email or an inbound phone call to allow it. They have to hang up and they have to call you at your phone number to verify that it's really you or you have to go down to the bank and verify signatures. Now, once again, could somebody who's really clever still tap your phone, bypass it? Yes, but once again, acceptable levels of risk. And then the third one, and this is probably the biggest, is if you're a business owner, you want to make sure that for all of your payments, transactions, and everything else, you're only using credit cards. You want to stay away from debit cards. And here's the reason. If somebody goes in and does a fraudulent credit card transaction, you're not out the money. The credit card company is. Mm -hmm. And you have 30 days to go in and say, this wasn't me, reported as fraud. And you're only liable up to $50. Wow. Even, even if it was fraud it's, it's really the credit cards issue however if you use a debit card and somebody steals that it comes right out of your account you're liable and in a lot of cases you don't have any protection to get that money back so i know a lot of these financial advisors tell small and medium-sized business owners no run your business from debit cards because you control the money it comes out you, you know what your assets are for cash accounting uh, versus accrual accounting, it gives you more visibility, but it's probably one of the most dangerous things you can do because attackers know that. Like, for example, if you look at, if you've gone to CNN or Fox News, all of the ads that pop up for toilet paper and hand sanitizer that are scams, mm -hmm. those are sites that you're going to purchase it. And right now they say we only allow debit cards. Oh. We're only allowing debit cards because of the transaction fee. The reality is they know if they do fraud and they don't ship you the goods and you're on a credit card, you're just going to report it as fraud and they're not going to make their money. But if you pay with a debit card, the money comes out immediately and they're long gone by the time you figure it out. So, so just be really careful of utilizing those debit versus credit cards. 
that's a really great point. We make it a point to actually use our American Express card because it's very easy to dispute a charge. Yes. Right. And, you know, we purchase a lot from overseas as well. And we had an incident where we bought $200,000 in computer components and they ended up shipping us counterfeit components. Yeah. So we <laughs> disputed it. It was instantly back in our account and we were protected. So that's such wise advice, Eric. Um, there's two other things here that, that we've implemented over the years in, 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 with our cybersecurity plan. And one is for businesses, your bank, most banks for business accounts can set up a wire transfer and ACH authorization. So when you log in, let's say as an executive, it'll have a list of approved templates and you just click on your computer, approve, approve, approve. And to log into that portal, you have a two-stage authentication, right? So yes. it does what you're talking about, but it also has an extra layer of manually approving that. And that might save people some time instead of going down to the bank or, you know, calling, especially with the phone lines tied up now. Um, we found that to be great because I probably authorize 200 ACH and wires, a, you know, a week. And, and that makes it easy for me to do it remotely. Yeah, now that, that, that's great advice. And it comes down to frequency and risk. Just on the business that I'm in, we don't do a lot of uh, ACHs and EFTs and things like that. It's maybe one or two a quarter. Mm -hmm. So in my case, because it's such a low frequency, I'm willing to do the out-of-band phone call because it's a little safer. However, you're right. If you're in a business where you're approving two or 300 a month and you have a lot of external vendors, jumping on a phone is not practical. But your advice is spot on where you have the extra level, you authenticate, you're still verifying, you're still doing an out-of-band, but it allows you to do it quicker, faster, so it really doesn't interrupt the process as much. So that's another great solution. There's a second one, which is kind of after the fact, triage to damage. Um, in fact, my insurance agent, like 15 years ago, let me know this, he said you could add a cyber liability and fraud coverage to your commercial insurance. And what was pretty cool about it, though, is that someone actually wire frauded us somehow about 10 years ago, $100,000. And we actually, the guy added it, our insurance dude, and we had half a million dollars in coverage for, for wire fraud or cybersecurity breaches or data security breaches. And it really saved our butt. Um, so that's, that's been a really big one for us, too. But that's kind of post-fact, too, if you have a small business. It's really cheap because it's based off your revenue, right? Yeah. Um, and if you're making more, well, it costs a little more. <laughs> If you're making a little less, you know, it, it costs significantly less. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is I'm a big fan. <coughs> I'm a big fan of pushing the insurance for fraud because that's pretty clean, pretty clear, and they'll pay. The one that I urge small business owners to be super careful with is the cyber insurance for hacking mm -hmm. because most of those, the clauses in there say, oh, yeah, I have a hacking insurance for $2 million. It sounds great but they require that all systems are updated, that all passwords are secure. And I found in cases where small businesses actually get hacked, the insurance companies never pay <laughs> because there's always some clause in there. So I would just go in for the fraud, absolutely. But for cyber insurance, I'd say be super careful because in a lot of cases you're paying the premium, but you're never gonna get the payout because of some little uh, disclaimer that's in the policy. It always seems those insurance companies are trying to skip out of paying out, right? <laughs> oh, of course. If insurance companies paid every claim, they go out of business, right? So that so you have to recognize that an insurance company wants to be your best friend when you're receiving the payment. But when you have to pay out, they don't become your best friend anymore because they want to find a reason not to pay. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> something kind of interesting on Windows-based PCs and also on Mac PCs, though, you know, there's a lot of good security software out there as well that can offer maybe even a higher level of protection. And what's kind of interesting is this, we run a couple of different pieces of software for ourselves and clients. And a lot of times when you get emails or phishing links and things like that, if you were to click on them, some of the software that we use, it actually gives you this red flag. And yeah. it's like, no, <laughs> don't go there. Click this and this to get out of here. If you really want to go and it takes you through like two or three steps, right? you can risk going there, but they give you this big red warning. What's your thoughts on some of that software? Do you think it helps a little bit? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I recommend for everyone who's working from home and in general to do uh, three things. One is make sure you're running the latest version of the operating system. I know a lot of people 
uh, have to work from home and use their old computers. And I see friends that are running Windows 7 or even some XP. And, and, and that's it. It's really bad. You got to get a Windows 10, the latest version. So that's the first thing. Second is make sure that your operating system and all the apps are fully patched and up to date. And then the third thing I recommend is get endpoint secure. Now, I know some of the vendors get mad at me because they like to think they're all unique in the marketplace, but they're all pretty similar. Whatever one gives you the best deal, whether it's McAfee, Symantec, Sophos, Kaspersky, whatever gives you the best deal, put it on there, pay for it, and it'll go a long way to protect you. But here's the advice I always want to caveat it with. I can give you the safest car on the planet. I can give you a car that has anti-lock brakes, uh, collision avoidance, and all those things. But if you're a dangerous driver, you can still drive that car into a tree and kill yourself. <laughs> so true. even the safest car is ultimately based on the safety of the driver. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing I can give you or your company can give you a safe computer. Windows 10, fully up to date, latest service pack, fully patched with endpoint security is a very, very safe computer. But in the hands of a dangerous user, they can still smash it into a tree. They can still do stupid things. So you still have to recognize that even though you have the endpoint security, you still have to be careful. You still have to be careful of what links you click on, what attachments you open, recognizing that browsers and email clients are the two most dangerous applications on the planet. Because I have a lot of friends that are like, Eric, I have endpoint security. I can do anything I want to get it to crazy. <laughs> so you still have to be careful, even though it's a good piece of software to have. So that's really great advice to have. I mean, that extra layer of protection is great, but you got to use your head, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's important. So let's just talk about the shift gears a little bit. Um, tell us about uh, secure-anchor.com. That's your, your website. And professionally now, you help companies secure their whole data system and everything like that. Let's just talk about that a little bit. And how long have you been doing that for now? So full-time secure anchor has been uh, three years. I, I always had it as an entity, but, but focusing on that hundred percent has been three years because I bought and sold a few companies. I helped build some of the best training the, my course that I'm an author of, Sec 401 Security Essentials, the number one cybersecurity course on the planet. And that's with provable numbers. I know people always claim that, but I can prove that uh, with numbers. But, but I finally got to the point where I'm like, you know something? I want to go full out. I want to go and do my own company 100%, really help people, train people, make a difference. And, and this is sort of one of my other life advice pieces is you're standing on that cliff of life. And you could play it safe and you could have a good job. And I was making good money working for these other companies, but I could also jump, get a little cut up, get a little beat up, have some failures, but live my dream. And that's what I ultimately decided. Cause one of my favorite quotes that really caused me to do secure anchor 100% is if you're not willing to invest and live in your dream, other people will surely pay you to invest in their dream. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I was doing is I was getting paid good money and making somebody else hundreds of millions of dollars. So somebody was paying me to invest in their dream because I wasn't brave enough. So now I jumped out, I'm living my dream and now I'm investing in myself. So I, I urge people, it's scary, it's risky, but sometimes you just have to jump off that cliff and know that at some point that parachute is going to open. And the reason I really wanted Secure Anchor is I really want to build future security leaders because I don't think there's enough security people out there to really protect us. So I'll go into companies and we'll build out roadmaps. We'll give them visibility. We'll put together some of the best risk assessments they've ever seen because it's very simple, actionable, and speaks to a language that the executives really can understand. And I can go into organizations and brief the board of directors and translate between the security team to really help implement effective security because I'm really on a mission to make cyberspace safe. But if you really want to drill down, what I'm ultimately about is building security leaders in the future that can actually effectively secure and protect companies. Because let's face it, I'm not trying to be critical of CISOs that are out there today. But many organizations are spending a ton of money on security. They have a bunch of resources. They have a chief information security officer. And they're getting broken into because they're fixing the wrong problem. 
they're not focusing in correctly on cybersecurity. So I feel with my 30 years and being a professional hacker, I understand what the real issues are. I understand how an attacker will really break into your organization. And I'm going to give you those highest priority items and teach people how to do that so we can have plenty of people out there to protect secure our families, our companies, our country, and the world. Because to me, even though everyone's focusing right now on the economy and on health, I truly believe at the end of the day, cybersecurity is the number one threat facing companies and facing our nation. And we are just ill prepared to deal with it. This is massively great. I want to summarize some of the wisdom that you shared here. And correct me though, if I didn't get right. okay. I take notes here like crazy. So two-stage authentication, two-factor authentication, super critical. You talked about uh, uh, wire transfer fraud. That's a big deal now. So don't click on those emails that are trying to fish for your, to your company or you, to you personally. And make sure you educate your people on those things as well, your, your whole team, your whole accounting team and everybody, right? Um, you're also recommending to make sure that you have the freshest OS. So don't be running Windows 7 or XP or something old. Make sure you have the newest with all the patches. And then you're also recommending good endpoint security um, software to make sure that you're, you're protected, right? Is that the, 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 the few things that people can do to kind of, you know, put the shields up a little bit? <laughs> exactly. That's great. And the only other thing I would add is the way you're going to get infected is by clicking on links or opening attachments. So the more you can be careful with that, or even what I do, because I do all my work on a windows, but every morning when I pre-filter my email, I always do it on a non windows device. So if you're not sure about an email, click the link on an iPhone or an iPad, but not on a Windows device because it'll just reduce your overall risk. Good, good. That's good advice. Um, so again, uh, secure-anchor.com. Where else can people find you? Can they find you on social media or anywhere else you want to direct everybody? Yeah, on social media, I produce a lot of content, a lot of free eBooks. It's Dr. Eric Cole, D-R-E-R-I-C-C-O-L-E is my handle on all those platforms. And also we put together right now uh, working from home in a safe, secure manner. Uh, we put together some eBooks on that. So if you go to secure-anchor.com slash cyber guide, you can actually get a free guide that has a lot of this advice we talked about and even some additional tricks on how to keep yourself and your coworkers or your business safe during these crazy times. Eric, I just wanted to thank you for, we're running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to thank you for all this knowledge and people can go to your site and you've got tons of free knowledge there so yeah. <laughs> everybody go over and visit uh, eric at uh, secure-anchor.com and also on his social media and and he's just a, a just a vast jedi <laughs> of knowledge on this particular subject though um anything you want to leave the audience with any last thoughts as well um to, to help them through all this as they're working from home and those things uh probably the biggest piece of advice which is going to sound crazy coming from a tech guy is we're working from home our kids are doing school from home. We are dependent more on technology than we've ever been. But recognize that nothing replaces social interaction. So put the phones down, put the tech down. One of the things that I do is cell phone free weekends where everyone in the family doesn't use tech for the weekend or dinner time, two hours during dinner time, no tech. So I just urge people that during these crazy times, put down the tech, support each other, engage in real world social interaction. Just keep six feet apart, but don't get so reliant on tech because I feel like right now with everyone working from home with social distancing, that we're all moving to a virtual lifestyle and we are so dependent on our technology that we're using that human touch. So I just say, keep things in balance and be safe. Oh, that's great advice, man. I'm going to practice that myself this week. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Eric, for coming on. Um, I really appreciate you. Uh, and everyone out there, remember, uh, take notes. Watch this again. Take Eric's notes on the security measures you can take for your company or yourself personally to keep your family uh, safe in, in the cyber world. And um, another thing, too, again, make sure you share this with loved ones um, that may benefit from this knowledge as well. Eric, I thank you again. And we'll see you guys all next week. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs>